My name is Richard Edwards. I am the executive director of iLearn Research at Ball State University. And iLearn Research is a part of the university where my team that works with me, and I have instructional designers, software developers, and learning analysts, um, is the part of the university where we try to push what is possible, especially in online education. So in many ways, I've always used the metaphor that um, my team is a team that's working um, in an innovation sandbox, and I'll explain all these terms uh, very shortly. Um, this all starts in this talk with the idea of the Canvas network. So how many people here have actually used Canvas network in the past? So taught a course on it or designed a course for the Canvas network? Okay, so quite a few of you. Um, I'm going to be focusing exclusively on the Canvas network in this talk. At Ball State University, we have been with Canvas network since the very beginning. Um, when Josh Coates put out his first press release on November 1st, 2012, uh, Ball State University had three MOOCs that we taught out of the first 20 on the Canvas network. So we have partnered with Canvas network and their sensational team now for over five years. And there's just been a lot of lessons learned that I'm gonna hopefully be able to share with you. And I wanna leave a good amount of time at the end for questions. So, um, but I'm also the type of speaker that if you have a question in the middle of the talk, don't worry about interrupting me. We, you know, we can uh, ask him if you got him. Um, in terms of an innovation sandbox, my team is designed to try out um, new things, to test ideas and explore new practices. And that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different schools. But Ball State in particular has dedicated a certain amount of resources to things that might not be ready for the paid enrolled students. So one of the major distinctions I make in this talk is when I'm doing some of the innovations that I'm doing on the Canvas network, I am testing them before we ever deploy them to the fully enrolled students in our accredited courses. I use the Canvas network as a way to try out new ideas without the risk of screwing up a class in which someone's paying tuition dollars. Um, I love the openness element of that activity because there's, it minimizes and mitigates uh, the risk of trying something out in a course that uh, lives outside of accreditation. Um, another element to be possibly a little more precise is when I think about an innovation sandbox as uh, in, in the way I use it at Ball State, it's part of, about building a culture of learning innovation. So one of the things I always want to encourage as part of this talk is innovation for its own sake is not anything I'm particularly interested in, but as part of a culture in which we are encouraging our faculty, our professional staff, our administrators to think more boldly, especially on one particular element to just deliver a better learning experience for our students. I want to build a culture around that so that people are willing to try new ideas and to try to create uh, multiple people lifting this very heavy rock. And so these are the things that I've tried to um, uh, bring out as part of uh, what I do at Ball State, which is to really use the Canvas network courses as a way to foster continuous learning, to um, encourage creative thinking, and I'll show you some examples of that from my current course. Um, it's also to test out risk tolerance at any institution. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of us who are very similar on different institutions. I've worked on four different campuses, and I can tell you all four campuses had a different risk tolerance. And so you have to learn what your campus will tolerate um, as part of this so that you, know, you can fall within strategic mission. Um, I'm also very interested over time about how this can generate opportunities to bring in new faculty members, to bring in and develop expertise around professional staff, and also as a way to rewrite campus histories. So as someone who's been doing this for about 20 plus years now, um, we all know that when we're, any of us are doing innovation, there are stories on campus that precede us. And frequently you'll hear about, oh, we can't do that. The last person who tried it failed. 
Um, and it's hard to sometimes reboot an innovation culture if there's been a lot of false starts on your campus. So I've tried to use my projects at Ball State to uh, re-encourage the imagination of the community to uh, think again, to be creative. One of the things I like to share just as a startup of how I think about this innovation sandbox model is that there are all different sorts of points at which we are talking about the role of innovation. For my purposes here on the talk I'm giving today, we're gonna to be much more at the innovators level where it's going to be more about risky, unproven, and experimental, but what is important about that is the timeline for that is usually the space of a single semester. So if you're gonna fail, you can fail fast. But then as you proceed down the list, just following the classic Everett Rogers uh, diffusion of innovation uh, model, you can start to see that by the time you get to something like a campus-wide LMS, you're at the late majority and it has to be absolutely fairly risk-free. So part of where I live for the most part is at the beginning uh, tiles up there at the innovator, uh, sometimes at the early adopters, but then usually my team hands off to a very different team uh, for the early majority and the late majority. The other part that I just want to establish so that we have shared premises as we get into the specifics is there's also different ways of encouraging stakeholder buy-in. So the other part that I want to be clear about as part of my talk is it is sometimes fun being the crazy man in the wilderness um, and trying to do really fantastic but possibly outside the scope of what people can adjust to quickly. And as I've done this job more and more, while I am constantly pushing an agenda of innovation, um, the one thing my career has taught me that is unless you're bringing along a team of like-minded stakeholders, you are going to eventually, it's gonna run aground. Um, you need at some point to have that greater community investments so that as you do these types of projects, the goal always should be that dissemination, the sharing of the risk, the sharing of the workload, the sharing of the creative thinking. Um, if a shop becomes understood solely as that's where innovation happens and the rest of the campus can wall you off, it's just not going to be the best outcome for your initiatives. So what I'm going to highlight for you today in our very brief talk we have is uh, talk about some of the uh, MOOCs that Ball State has done with the Canvas Network going back to 2012. Um, so in our first three MOOCs we did that launched in spring of 2013, we did a uh, comic book course that studied uh, gender issues taught by Christy Blanche. We did a math course for pre-calculus taught by uh, the chair of our math department at Ball State, and I taught a course in my uh, professional specialty, which is film noir. Um, so my PhD is actually in film studies, um, even though I've been for the last 15 years exclusively on the educational side of the house, but uh, old habits die hard. Um, so a lot of the stuff, when I do teach, I teach film. Um, then we um, established uh, uh, those First three were very successful, then we had a second go round where uh, we taught a course where we then started to work with Turner Classic Movies. So the weird part about this initiative I'm talking about today is I do have some possible, I am able to do certain things in my um, courses I do on Canvas Network because I have a corporate partner, uh, Turner Classic Movies which does some of the underwriting and subsidizing of the course. Um, and so that does allow me to have access to different types of things. But one of the things I want everyone to walk away with is even though sometimes my experience might at this point be fairly costly, I think there are uh, takeaways that can be done um, in different ways and I'll show you uh, a few of those. And then uh, the first year we did was 2015. We did Turner Classic Movies presented my film noir course. Last year we did a course on slapstick comedy and this, uh, actually teaching it right now, it ends um, August 7th, um, is my current course, uh, 50 Years of Hitchcock. Uh, this course is taught in connection with programming on Turner Classic Movies. So if you uh, so Friday night, this Friday, is the last films of the late 60s and early 70s, and my course ties into the on-air uh, programming. Um, 
All of these courses have been massive. So my Hitchcock course has 16,600 um, students enrolled. So it's a fairly uh, sizable course. And uh, the film noir course had 21,000. So you know we've had um, quite big numbers. And that's one of the other important takeaways is I frequently have used these Canvas network courses to stress test uh, new ideas um, because you really do see what works and doesn't work when you have 10,000 people pounding on the course at the same time. It just, it really, uh, any flaws in the design are seen immediately. So one of the things that have always animated me as I've uh, come out of my disciplinary background, which is film studies, is I've had this even before I taught the Hitchcock course. I've been talking for years about how would Alfred Hitchcock shoot an instructional video, and I think it's an important element of the innovation sandbox is to, um, one of the things I encourage my team, and my team comes from a lot of different disciplines, is for them to bring their disciplinary expertise um, into uh, teaching and learning. And so we have people who have backgrounds in music, in theater, and in art. And um, I really always encourage my team as we're inventing new ways of approaching things to think through the lens of those other disciplines because that's often where a breakthrough idea will come through. For me, this is always important to me because I start to think about what would be the elements that I would want in an instructional video. And a course like the Canvas Network allows me to try out some new ideas. So if I escape out of here for a second and hit end show, um, let me show you like what we did for our videos for um, TCM, uh, for the TCM course. So this um, course, I, uh, TCM and, and Ball State are alternating um, who's shooting the lecture videos. So the lecture videos for last year for the slapstick course, we shot on the sound stages down in Atlanta, and I was able to shoot my videos on the inside the NBA studio set, and I was able to sit at that uh, desk where they uh, do the halftime show um, and use the big screen and the telestrator. This year it was Ball State's turn and I wanted to return back to a concept that has been very passionate for me which is to avoid the talking head syndrome and I feel that it's always important for a good teaching video to be part of a conversation and so I decided to work with our um, Teleplex crew which is University Media Services. We have uh, green screen studios at Ball State because we're also the local affiliate for uh, public broadcasting. And we shot Charlie Rose style. So I went with a very simple set dressing, a simple oak table, and I had one of my uh, colleagues, Dr. Wes Gehring, who is a uh, expert on film, and we had a conversation on all of the different Hitchcock films and released them as our lecture videos. Um, it was very cost effective because I was leveraging campus resources and then I have my own students in a class I teach do all the post-production work. And so my head editor, Henry Tegler, decided that as a personal challenge to himself that all of the videos would be introduced in the style of Hitchcock credits. And again, it was very affordable because I did it at student labor, student wage costs. And, but let me just show you the opening of what I was doing and what I think the Canvas Network allowed me to do, especially with um, um, the other trick of what I, I'm allowed to do is because I'm uh, partnering with Turner Classic Movies, I get rights clearances for the film rights. So I can actually put film clips um, legally um, into all of my things. I don't have to do educational fair use because I'm sponsored. But um, let me show a qu quick video. How do I make it bigger? Oh, up there. So let's move to our um, third film of the 1950s. Um, what is now considered by many the greatest film ever made in the Hollywood studio system, Vertigo from 1958. See, and all At this time, is being done with student labor. It did get some critical attention. It was uh, nominated for Best Art Direction for Hal Pereira so, and Henry Bumstead. Dropping in B-roll. It also uh, was nominated for Best Sound by, for George Dutton. But intriguingly, and I just want to share this with um, the students, um, this was one of five films that Hitchcock pulled from circulation for over 30 years. So he pulls Vertigo, Rear Window, Rope, The Man Who Knew Too Much, and The Trouble with Harry which I always think is really fascinating to me because I really think it slowed down his critical reputation at the beginning of 
uh, the origins of film schools in the late 60s and 70s because those are some of his yeah. best, most interesting films for critical analysis. Yeah. And they're just shelved until really the 1980s when they come back in full force. Oh. And even now... Now if I jump ahead a little... And now we're saying it's the greatest film ever made. Uh, and, and so it's an it's interactive conversation with me and Wes Garing. It's the only Hitchcock film where I see it, and I don't know if it really happened or it's a dreamlike scenario. Yeah. So I, I struggle with it along those lines. And I, I had to, to get to like it, I had to reframe it as Jimmy Stewart as director making over a, a woman as an actor. And actress. so we can illustrate it way, with not to uh, the film clips whatever, as he's talking. It's almost the beginning of Hitchcock maybe being a little okay. more. So I just wanted to show some of that. Things. So we, we ended up in the course, and this is the course over here in the student view. So this is what it actually looks like in. Uh, the Canvas network. We ended up releasing these within a uh, module setup. So when we designed the course for uh, the Canvas network, we, we have this uh, designed around um, different modules that can open up, and the uh, internet is slow in this room. Um, and we have, uh, we built it in a tabs method um, that also works perfectly on mobile, and you can always just go every uh, day, it's a daily course, there's five lessons a week uh, with the uh, video, and then we also have what we call the daily dose in which we release a uh, film clip that that generates the classroom discussion. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting that my team has been exploring has been how to deal with uh, some of the limitations of discussion boards, because we, when you have massive numbers of students, um, we ran into very interesting issues around just simply how do you do a threaded discussion. Um, our daily doses usually get somewhere between 600 to 3,000 posts, and so it becomes a madness of um, almost a, a problem of plentitude. Um, we've solved some of this in the MOOC environment because a lot of my students are actually professors and teachers themselves, and they do a lot of the curation on the site. And one of the things we did as an innovation that we're still working out as our team is there is so much new knowledge produced by these Canvas network courses. We didn't want the discussion boards to just solely be inside of the Canvas network because then when the course closes, you lose all of that commentary on the films. And so we actually use um, evergreen message boards over at TCM.com so that all of the courses we've taught with TCM, all of the message boards going back to 2015 are still available and open for other students to review and learn from, which is part of the innovations that we are focused on uh, at Ball State, which is how students in these courses are producers of new knowledges and not just consumers of knowledge. And how can you take the learning of a course um, in the Canvas network and then move it into um, you know, uh, uh, into a, another object that people can learn from. So that's one of the things we've been focused on um, in this course. We also started to explore in this course um, the use of Padlet. So Padlet was a new experiment for me on the um, Hitchcock course. I don't know how many of you here have used Padlet before. Um, it's a really interesting um, tool. It was suggested to me by uh, Jane Esco of the Canvas Network. Um, and it allows you to do little um, post-its. It ma makes me think of um, the old-fashioned co conferences we used to go to 20 years ago where you'd pin up an index card to talk about um, something, about trying to find a topic. Um, but in a massive course, um, it is amazing to just read because it becomes um, um, a, uh, a self uh, the community self-curates it. Um, I haven't really had to do much beyond um, deliver it to the students, but it became another tool for communication, and I, I definitely am interested in looking more um, in the Padlet. Yes? Is Padlet free? Um, Jane would have to answer that. I don't. Yes? So we're also um, very interested in um, badges in this. So one of the issues that um, my team has really been focused on over time has been flexibility of learning experience. And so 
A lot of the new tools in Canvas Network, if you're not familiar with them, have just been a godsend in these courses that are open and massive. Um, how many people here are using the Mark is Done feature in the modules? Are you guys using that? Because uh, let me do that first. So under the modules, and I apologize, I'm not allowed to walk past this white thing. Um, in the modules, if you see um, uh, in my course, you actually have on the far right uh, complete all items, and that's what the students are seeing so that as they are pro progressing through the modules, I have all of my daily modules set on time release. And as the module uh, opens, um, and if you haven't checked in for say four days, there's gonna be four modules open, and you might be confused, have I done that module or not done it? Canvas Network um, now has the functionality for uh, having the students create their own breadcrumb trails with complete all items. The other part that's nice, what we have um, started to experiment with, is then to have a weekly confirmation moment around badging. And so what I did with the um, badging was I created with my team a series of six badges. It's a six week course, and you get a badge for completing an entire week, which is five daily modules. But one of the things that I just want to share, which has turned out to be a huge success that we kind of backed into, uh, just because again, working with Hitchcock, what would Hitchcock do, is each of the badges, we created a thematic set. So each badge is a MacGuffin from a Hitchcock movie appropriate for the era. So it was the black glove from uh, Blackmail, um, the MacGuffin in 39 Steps is Mr. Memory, so it's the picture of the human brain. Um, the Great MacGuffin from Notorious is a wine bottle with radioactive uranium. And what ended up happening, and this is a very important lesson, this was one we just learned by just doing something and then the community told us this was something they liked. They started to want to collect these badges because they were thematic and they were like, oh my God, I'm missing badge number three and I need all six MacGuffins because it's a set. And when something's missing in a set, it drives certain people crazy. And so we started the pitch, you gotta collect all six MacGuffins. And then once they collect all six MacGuffins, then that gives us an easy way to issue certificates because this is a sign of completion. And the other part that um, we played with is, I don't know if I can make this um, any bigger, um, but uh, all of the MacGuffins were, all of these um, word, all of these were done as word art. So I just took a wine bottle shape and it just says 1940s Alfred Hitchcock Notorious. And, 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 and in the shape of um, the other part we did was, since it's a partnership with TCM, it's all the TCM uh, brand colors. Um, so, so that was a very important takeaway. The other thing we started to explore in our innovation sandbox is I have two developers who work with me and we have created original games for the Canvas network. So we created one game called Hitch or Hike. So is this a picture from a Hitchcock film or not? Hitch or Hike? Yeah, isn't Bird Hitch? No, it's, it's a hike. It's all that heavens allows. Um, Hitch or Hike, this one. Nope, it's the best of everything. Hitch or Hike? It's a hike again. Um, but then uh, this one's gun crazy. Um, but I'll get you, the, the, this one, Lifeboat, this one's Hitch. But I'm just saying, so what was interesting is we've developed this game, we think it has applications in art history courses, but it was to create visual literacy. These are films the students have seen and um, have been exposed to in the lesson plan. So it's not a random game, it's random to you guys, but there's a context inside the course. We also... Uh, it was custom built by my developer. So I have a software developer who works in my innovation sandbox, which is a, um, a blessing beyond blessings. I mean, I, I fully understand that. So we made three games. So here's, let me show you the next game. So we created a game called Norman based off of the game um, Hangman. I used this to teach vocabulary of the um, names. When you're teaching Alfred Hitchcock, I am bombarding you with 200 new names every week. Just names of cinematographers, names of art directors. So I needed a way for students to start registering the names of the um, creative personnel. So again, Chris Turvey, who works for me, created Norman. So in Norman, it's just a hangman game, 
but the spaces there are the name of a name that I've taught you in the module, but now you gotta guess it, um, and you can get a hint. So there's a hint. So it's a filmmaker, screenwriter, or producer. And then you can just start guessing letters. And, if, and as you miss, instead of it being a gallows and a stick figure, um, it is actually plays out the shower scene from the movie Psycho. Um, so, um, you know, we, we have that. Um, and then, then I, can t I know what the name is because I'm teaching the course. But then if you don't get it right, um, the final um, outcome, the eyeball of Janet Lee in the shower, um, but if you, you get eight guesses, but if you completely miss everything, then it says game over. Uh, the answer was Ivor, Ivor Montague, a very important early collaborator of Hitchcock. We then did a third game, and all of these games were designed to explore different types of learning outcomes to give a gamification feel to our course. And we really only used um, um, a... Um, uh, the Canvas network is really what gives us the ability, I really think, to do some of these things. It's also the scale and the sponsorship of TCM. But um, in um, Strangers on a Quiz, we then created a original quiz up module where you can actually play against me as the instructor. So you can play a quiz game against me and then it's on a 2,000 point timer. So how many silent films did he direct? It was more than five. Took me a moment to get it, so I only got 1656 for the answer, but Professor Edwards was quicker than me at 1913. Um, he's slightly better, okay. Um, I, I've worn Novello, see, but he beat me again, uh, uh, that professor guy. Um, but we do this, again, as rapid quizzing without any grades, and I released this prior to the Saturday quiz so that they can rapidly test in a fun environment ideas, and they, the students have loved the idea that they can play against me and test their speed and knowledge. And I've had uh, people actually uh, study for strangers on a quiz because they want to beat my score. Um, so it turned out to be highly engaging. It's been part of the design of the course to really start to look at these different things like Padlet, like these um, mini games, like this Charlie Rose style video, the Daily Dose, which sends them over to the TCM. Um, message board, um, all as a way to use the openness of the network and 16,000 learners to just test out some ideas. So the part that um, I will open up for questions now, but um, it really was um, a fun way to um, start to design um, a course. It, it is a regular uh, course. If you're not a subscriber to uh, TCM, I do give um, a list of just what the major titles are uh, with the encouragement since it's an open course to just rent them from your local library. Um, and we also have a social media game we're playing called Find George Kaplan, which we play on Twitter. So it's just a, it, it creates just a community feel and um, it enhances engagement. So statistically, so here would be the number. So we're in, we're about to end, we're in week five and I don't have the data yet, but I have the data through week four. So I have 16,600 students enrolled, of which 10,400 are active weekly, which is a 63% engagement rate on a free course. So this type of model is bringing them back in consistently. And while I don't have the data yet as to what is the stickiest, if they're coming back to play the games and then they watch the modules, everything is um, mapping together. Um, I use Vimeo for my videos, so I have video statistics to say they're watching the videos. I have game statistics, Chris Turvey has back in analytics, that matches. I have uh, page views from Jane Esco's report, it all matches. We have 10,000 active students and they probably are all coming by for different things. And part of what we test out, so here's the final thought and I'll open it up for questions. One of the things I test out is, we built this as a design with my team and we just map it out on like giant whiteboards. But then we want to see, did we make something sticky? And so we're in the middle of that experiment right now. But on a paid course, I don't know if I'd necessarily throw all this into a paid course. This is an experimental course where no one's paying me. You know, it's the, 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 the student cost of the enrollment is free. So I feel I can um, go beyond the boundaries a little bit more than if it were a course. And then the other part that I just got to um, be very clear about, you just learn things with 10,000 students, you don't learn with 25 students. You just learn things. And when something breaks, 
You have to have intestinal fortitude to power through 400 emails with just a cut and paste. It will be fixed, it will be fixed, it will be fixed, it will be fixed, it will be fixed. So, you know, there, there is an intestinal fortitude part of this um, and a lot of uh, kindness with the community. I, I spend a lot of time saying thank you and thanks for your patience because some of this stuff does break in real time. Um, but the team is amazing behind me and we try our best to just always keep it up and running. Okay, question. Yeah, yes. And so messaging, I, and this is, this is again one of the hard won lessons. When I was in the film noir course in 2015, every time something broke I used the announcement tool and then that got everyone edgy because people are like, what, something broke? And because you're right. Um, what I've done increasingly is the people, I, I, so, so one of the great tricks on the Canvas networks, so I'll give you, I, I'll share every trick I can give you. I have, re I have several students who are third time around. I knew they were coming back and I've deputized them and I said, check the module first. Like just, you are my beta testers. Like I, I turned my modules on at midnight and so by 12.05 a person named Meredy um, will email me saying, uh oh, this link is broken and she's like my rapid adjuster. I could do it with students, I could do it with professional staff, but because it's a free course, I like that the community kind of self-polices. Um, so I've deputized people. I've also um, I identified professors. So in the Hitchcock course, we have about 400 professors um, out of the 16,600, and I just deputize them. I say, when you're on a message board, you can correct a point because you're a professor. You are not just a student. You can you, you, you have the same mentoring ability. I deputize you. Please teach. You're a teacher. And so I have, I do that. I, I, I crowdsource. I mean, I let the network live and let them do it. Yes. You have to um, do a couple different things. Um, one is I ask them to self-disclose. I ask, uh, please email me if you're a college professor. Because I just, uh, part of this is I love networking. And so if I'm gonna do this and spend 18 hours a day running a course like Hitchcock, I mean, there has to be some uh, collateral benefit, and one of them is it builds my network. So I, I ask them to self-disclose. Um, and also a lot of them just disclose anyways because they um, are interested. A lot of professors take this course uh, specifically because they just wanna see what some of the um, new ideas are. Um, I just, it's a blessing that I work with Jane Esco, who's in the audience here, but we are allowed, I, I just, I feel like I can push like the boundaries of the Canvas network. Canvas gives me a lot of support because we go back uh, five years. So we, we put a lot of the newest uh, features into these courses. So some people enroll now just to see what some of the new features are and to test them out before they adopt them. Yes. I think it's interesting you mentioned that you release a new lesson each day. Daily. Yes, there's pros and cons. Um, we are, so my team, it's a great question. My team's focused on micro learning right now. Um, everything I've done on the Hitchcock course is 100% mobile facing. So I have been obsessed for about three years with, I think, and the Canvas network's ready today to be 100% mobile facing with the mobile app. I want in these, I, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with lifelong learning, and I really think one of the jobs my team has is how do we continue to educate post-graduation? Like, how do, how do we continue to stimulate lifelong learning? I think it has to be on the level of uh, daily engagements that have a certain lightness to them. So I use a game that's gonna take two minutes to coax them back in. All of the videos are 10 minutes. The daily dose is a three-minute clip. Everything is a minor, um, uh, amount of time so that no one has to set aside an hour to do it. I also do everything on tabs so that you can do one tab at a time and just come back. You don't have to do it all consecutively. Um, we um, have doubled our engagement rate from Noir. Uh, Noir was a weekly lesson um, that just, I released everything all at once and in a free course, half the audience freaked out and never came back. 
The weird part is when you release the same amount of knowledge in five equal sized chunks, it just doesn't feel as overwhelming. Um, the other element, the metaphor I have been obsessed with is I try to get people to read the front page by bringing them through the comics book page. So it's the old newspaper metaphor. It's like, I don't care if you're going to pick up the newspaper to check the sports scores or to do the crossword puzzle, but if you bought the newspaper, then maybe you might read uh, the news of the day or the opinion page. So I do the same thing. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say I try to coax them back in. I'll build these games like Hitcher Hike and... And then we also have a course hashtag, Hitchcock50, so you can check that out too. And we have over 4,000 active Twitter users. And so my Twitter stream is very active, and that's also how I get real-time intel on whether the course is working or not. Uh, things you can, again, do at scale and on the Canvas network. The Canvas network is the only way I could build this community. I don't have any other way to do this. And, you know, I mean, I could find another provider, but... I'm so pleased with Canvas Network, why would I look for another one? Yes? Could you please show again the Padlet screen? Yes, I can show that again. Um, did you have a question about Padlet or you just wanted to take a picture? Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, the other part, let me wait till the buffer refreshes. Wait till you see how, it's, it is literally the infinite scroll right now. There are so, so here, I will start scrolling down Padlet and uh, you, this, this is what makes me so happy. This is engagement, ladies and gentlemen. This is what I live for. They are, there is no grade associated with Padlet. I don't tell them. I just tell them Padlet's available. They use it. This is the community teaching themselves and also reaching out. This is where friendships are made. This is, this is connection. This is connection. It just goes on forever. Yes. Yeah. I see, I see yeah. Contributions, no, there are. There are people who follow the friendships. I don't want to overstate it because it's a very good catch. Twitter is where the best friendships are made. Um, we, are, we do do a lot of reach out on Twitter, and that's where most friendships are made. I have seen a few friendships in Padlet, though, because you can read the comments. There are people who are like, oh, I see you posting again, and then they can take it offline. There are ways that um, my course um, has several Facebook study groups that have spontaneously been created outside of the course ecosystem. And so the other part about openness is that the community builds things um, that are just complementary to the initial impulse. So I don't do anything with the Facebook study groups. That's just spontaneous. I don't even mention them. It's just they tend to uh, want to link to my Facebook page um, so I know they exist. Um, yes, in the back. Y yes. Yes. Yes, so a couple things. Um, the daily dose is been managed, uh, that the, uh, the daily dose is my most popular design feature that I think my team has ever um, come up with. Uh, the daily dose is a, and it works for film studies perfectly, it's a three minute clip and then there are three discussion questions. And what becomes interesting, and I can show this to you briefly and then I'm out of time in one minute, but um, what, what's exciting about um, the message boards is the targetedness of the daily dose is seen as a, um, a way that it stays on track. But then what we have done is, so we're over here. So my message board exists over at tcm.com. So this is, this is always up. This will never go down. Um, and this is part of their standard message boards. And What's important about it is it also mingles my students with the larger TCM community. So there's cross-pollination between my students and the viewership. Um, we do different things. I, I, in this initiative, because it's sponsored by TCM, I actually, they use a company called Mod Squad, which is board moderators. So we have paid board moderators, okay? So I do have special things that are not available to regular courses. So I do, these are moderated boards. Um, but the daily doses are incredibly popular, but then we also allow the students to create their own message boards, um, postings, 
And by the time you get to this point in the class, you know, we have probably 200 open threads, but it's easy to scan. It's not, it's not terrible, and the part that keeps bringing it together is the uh, having moderators, uh, people who are actually watching all of the stuff. And then I have a couple um, power users. Uh, there's Jimmy Jazz Guitar, um, who's posted over 2,000 times since 2015, and he's just a power moderator. I mean, he's just a fan. And he just goes into like every post and likes them and says, oh, you got the wrong link here. And so again, uh, scale, the, the community polices itself again. Um, so I'm out of time, but I will be happy to stay and answer any questions you have. Um, thank you. How do you know who They have to get, um, uh, uh, they, they have to get the six uh, badges. So the badges can only get um, released, you have to get 70% or better on the weekly quiz. So they take quizzes and the badges are released. Yes. No, I do know. It's all within the Canvas system. We use Badger. Um, and so Badger is also free on the Canvas network. So there's no cost to it. And so we tie Badger into the weekly quiz on Saturday. The condition to get a badge is you have to score 70% or higher. Now, in the Film Noir course, I did the quizzes as time quizzes and you only had one attempt. And then after answering 3,000 angry emails, we have avoided that policy. So it's uh, unlimited retakes on the quiz. It just has to be. It's a free course. Okay. Um, so people who score less than 70 just retake the quiz. You know. So if you really want a certificate, you can hack one. Yes. Yeah. No, but if people have to go, I mean, I, I'll keep answering questions. Yeah. No, it's separate. The, the, that's a good question. We have a separate certificate fulfillment process, correct. So to fulfill the certificates, again, I have a, a software developer. I have two. Um, so what we do is we set up, we, we export. So in terms of details, we export a CSV file of every student who meets the conditions. And then we run that against their name in Canvas. Then I have a developer who has written a script that pulls out the name on the CSV, publishes it into a PDF file. I lock the PDF file, and then we've written another program that auto emails that as an attachment to the email address on file inside Canvas Network. So it's two different programs. We have to write one program to say you've earned a certificate and a second one to execute, actually it's three. One to then print the name and then a third to execute the uh, thing. Um, and then you're, then you're also, if you're me, in the lifetime uh, certificate fulfillment business because I've had as recently as a couple weeks ago someone say, I've lost my film noir certificate, can you reprint it? And of course it's digital, it's a PDF. So I send it, yes. The games are not connected to the grades, they're just there no. for learning purposes, recall. So fun, fun engagements. Hitch or hike, visual literacy. Norman, learn the names, because I've bombarded you with 200 names. Uh, strangers on a quiz, the pretest of the weekly quiz. Yeah. And, and, uh, and because, and this goes back to just learning theory, I've always been unhappy that I had to remove the time limit on the weekly quiz. So I put the time limit back in the strangers on a quiz. So that at least I can know who my alphas are. Because we also have a leaderboard on, um, Strangers on a quiz, that is every student who takes it from 20,000, so perfect score is 20,000 points down to zero, and the leaderboard scrolls eternally. Um, and he's the guy right back there who built it. We're talking about Strangers on a Quiz right now, quiz. Yeah. But the leaderboard does that interface with Badger? No. Or is it a different leaderboard? It's a different leaderboard. leaderboard. It's a different leaderboard. It's your grade book. Right. It, we, 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 we tie, because of the, way we built it so that it'd be native to Canvas, and Chris would answer it better than I can, but your leaderboard is completely non-connected to anything in Canvas. The only thing we do is we pull in the, uh, their, their username and ID from them, and their image, so that you can see what's Yeah. So, so yes, there are two leaderboards. There's the badges board, and there is the strangers on a quiz. Yeah, yeah, 
It's not. It could be, given enough time and thinking through it, probably we could connect something. But yeah, right now they're separate. They're standalone. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, so um, the, 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 the number, the, 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 uh, it's a great question. Um, the first one is to make it optional because I, a lot of people, um, um, I, I learned the hard way that if you start to mandate message boards, it just gets messy and some people get in there and they don't have anything of value to say. So in my syllabus, one of the things that has created clarity on the message boards is I have flipped the instructions on the message boards just because I know it'll work in my class. So I tell the students first, I want you to be an active reader of the message board. I want you to read what other people are saying, like what they are saying, you know, because in the TCM message board, you can, uh, like on Facebook, you can click a love button. Like, I love this point. So I teach them first to be curators. Read what other people are saying. It's not as important if you don't have something to say, but contribute to the course. Read, love things, and or comment. You know, respond to it. That, and, and what's interesting is when you start with the instruction to encourage them to be readers, not writers, then you start to create the type of citizens of your course that are doing the practices you want. Um, I definitely, um, uh, part of this is about longitudinal um, engagement. I just have um, friends of the course now that take on editing, that they just, they like the course, they hate when the message boards get sloppy, and they're doing it as unpaid labor just similar to Wikipedia editors. Just, I can't explain it any other way. They're just fans of the course, they love that TCM is sponsoring this, and it's their way to give back. And without those people, our, my boards would go sideways. I mean, I had easily have a couple dozen people who are performing a similar function to Wikipedia editors. Yes? I just want to bounce off of that. Yeah. Is it very similar to, there's a MOOC called the Happiness MOOC. It's on another platform, I won't mention. But they use a similar strategy uh, for management. Yeah. They, they, they point people that are high performers yeah. to and they actually uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, the, and then the third one is targeted messaging. I mean, uh, you know, I really, I seed uh, the topics I want them to be discussing. Um, narrower, the better. Uh, when you have 10,000 active students, it's amazing how just the merest crack goes to this. But if you give, it, it's, it's the classic thing. Uh, we talked about it in the first keynote. It's about choice. I give them so little choice, it works. If I, if I say everything's fair game, it becomes a mess. But when I give them literally a binary, say this or that about Hitchcock, it stays focused. Minimize choice on message boards. They will appreciate it because I'm trying to hone their critical thinking. I, I, you can't teach writing skills on a message board, but you can hone or start to fashion a, a kind of critical thinking strategy, which then says narrower is better. So one of the things I do is I say precisely look at this shot and tell me everything you can say about it, and I can get a student to give me 500 words. But if I say analyze the whole movie, it's garbage. Narrower, better. Do you know which students plan narrower discussion boards based on their choice, or is everything in the same discussion board? I've done it both ways. I'm now back to just one discussion board. I, uh, the, I, if I were at a film school, where I had PhD students that I could pay as grad students, like the Penn Poetry class. If I could, I don't have doctoral students at Ball State. If I had doctoral students, I'd do two boards and I'd have the expert and the beginner board. And I'd have the, I, I would run the expert board and I'd have my TAs run the beginner board. I've always wanted to do it. I don't have the access to that at Ball State. But um, absolutely, if you can get student labor that is talented enough to moderate, the cost number on that is very reasonable but you have to have grad students, and I just don't have that. What I have, see the grad students I have, video production. So we, we do cool videos. Thank you. You're welcome.